So in previous lectures, we introduced the idea of storage and loss moduli. We related those to the, the uh, relaxation modulus. We also talked a little bit about the loss tangent, or tan delta, uh, and, and the meaning of that. What I want to do today is um, give you a few more relationships between complex quantities. So in particular, we're going to look at uh, um, the storage and, and loss compliance. So as opposed to the modulus, now we'll look at the compliance. We also are going to look at um, uh, the method that we would use. You know, we talked about originally that that the the storage and loss moduli were completely defined by the relaxation modulus. So there must be a way then to take either the storage or the loss moduli and recover the relaxation modulus. So we want to talk about how to do that. And also, I want to give you a qualitative picture of how the storage and loss moduli uh, are affected by frequency omega. Okay, so those are the kind of the topics we want to cover today. Let me begin by just reminding you what we've done previously. So we have done quite a bit of work, and we're going to use analogy to the previous results as opposed to derivation here to, to talk about the complex creep compliance. So let's begin and just say, remind you here, that previously, so these are all things that we've talked about in earlier lectures. Um, so we said that uh, for... Uh, an oscillatory applied strain, okay, and we define that applied strain as epsilon of t uh, is equal to epsilon naught um, e to the i omega t. Of course, we're only looking at the real component of that. We'll call that equation one. For an oscillatory applied strain given by equation one, the resultant stress uh, was given by uh, sigma of t is equal to uh, our complex modulus, y star, which was, we said, a function of i omega, times epsilon naught e to the i omega t, right? Call that equation 2, where we called this y star term the complex or the dynamic modulus. And we define that as, uh, so let's say where, that y star of i omega is equal to y prime, which is a function of omega, plus i times y double prime, which is a function of omega. Those don't mean derivatives. Those are just indicating um, the real component and the imaginary component. And we define those as the storage modulus and the loss modulus. OK, let's call that equation 3. And we could define the storage modulus and loss modulus. Again, we've already talked about all of this. We define that in terms of the relaxation modulus. So we said that the storage modulus y prime, which is a function of omega, is equal to y naught, which is the time independent component, uh, plus omega times the integral from 0 to infinity of y tilde of eta, eta being our variable of integration. Y tilde, remember, is just the time dependent um, portion of the relaxation modulus times the sine of omega eta uh, d eta. And we could compute the, the loss modulus, y double prime of omega, as just omega times the integral from 0 to infinity of y tilde of eta times the cosine of omega eta d eta. Okay? So we'll call that equation 4. We'll call this equation 5. Okay, we also showed uh, that we could write the stress uh, as follows. We, could, we said we could write it as we did in equation 2, or we could write it as sigma of t is equal to uh, sigma naught times e raised to the i times now omega t plus delta, okay? Uh, where we defined sigma naught as equal to the magnitude of the complex modulus i omega uh, times epsilon naught, okay? So let's go ahead and define this as equation 6. Equation 7. Again, I know I'm going fast through this, but these things we've already talked about. Uh, if you can't remember how we got to them, uh, I encourage you to go back and review our previous lectures. 
okay? Uh, and then I want to define formally that the delta, of course, being the lost tangent, lost tangent, so delta is the lost tangent. Um, and what does that indicate? Uh, indicating uh, the degree to which the, the stress leads the strain uh, under oscillatory loading, okay? We also know that delta is related to the storage and loss moduli, right? Uh, we could define uh, this tan delta, tangent of the, the, the loss tangent. So tan delta is equal to uh, the loss modulus, y double prime, divided by the storage modulus, y prime. I'll remind you that those are functions of omega. So the, this um, loss tangent must also be a function of omega. So let's go ahead and call that equation 8. So what I'm going to do now is, is write down the expressions for creep compliance. And I'll just say up, up front that we can develop these equations in the exact same manner that we did for the, the relaxation um, modulus, but I, I don't want to go through the uh, you know, two lectures worth of the math, okay? So uh, but it's, it's in a very, very similar way. And just say that we can develop expressions for the complex creep compliance uh, in a similar manner. Okay, but here we're just going to give the results by analogy, okay? We give the results by analogy, okay? So what, what do we want to say is, now remember, we, we for creep compliance, in contrast to the relaxation modulus, uh, we're going to apply a stress. So remember the relaxation modulus, we applied a strain. For the creep compliance, we're going to apply a stress, okay? So for an applied stress, that we're gonna say is sigma of t uh, equals sigma naught e to the i omega t. We'll call that equation nine. Uh, the resultant strain is gonna be given by epsilon of t is now equal to this complex creep compliance j star, which will be a function of i omega, times sigma naught e to the i omega t, call that equation 10, okay? Similarly, then, we say where uh, th this complex creep compliance j star of i omega is comprised of the quantity j prime as a function of omega plus i j double prime, also a function of omega. And now, this first term j prime, that's the storage compliance, and j double prime is the loss compliance. Okay, let's call that equation 11. In a very similar manner, we can compute both the storage and the loss uh, compliances uh, with an integral. Okay, so we say that uh, j prime of omega is going to be equal to some time independent component of that, j naught, plus omega times the integral from 0 to infinity of j tilde of uh, eta, right? J tilde being the time dependent component of the creep compliance times the sine of uh, omega eta d eta, okay? And similarly, for the loss compliance, J double prime of omega, that's just gonna be equal to omega times the integral from zero to infinity of J tilde, function of eta, now times the cosine of omega eta d eta. Okay, how about that being equation 12 and equation 13? Okay, it's also still related to the loss tangent. So the loss tangent uh, can still be uh, written as a function of these two variables. Okay, the loss tangent is gonna still be that tan delta is gonna be equal to j double prime, which is a function of omega, divided by j prime, which is a function of omega. Let's call that equation 14, okay? Th there's only a very small difference in terms of how tan delta is applied, okay? Uh, so let's just note what that difference is. So the only difference between simply substituting um, the relaxation modulus y, uh, substituting j in its place is, is as follows. So the only difference uh, that emerges is as follows. So for, for the complex 
relaxation modulus y as a function of i omega. We said that was equal to the magnitude of y star i omega times e to the i delta, if you remember that. Okay, That's how the relationship looked. Okay, But in the case of j star, which is a function of i omega, that's going to be equal to j star i omega, now e to the negative i delta, okay? Which, uh, if you don't remember what that looks like, um, that's just magnitude of j star, now times the cosine of delta minus i sine of delta, okay? Let's call that equation 15. Okay, that's not too surprising because remember that uh, uh, we're now j is basically inverted. So uh, if if uh, if y has this relationship e to the i delta, then one over e to the i delta is e to the negative i delta. So it's not not too surprising that this this uh, change exists. Okay. And then finally, there's a relationship, as you probably would expect, between the the uh, complex relaxation modulus and the complex creep compliance, okay? So I'll just give that to you without derivation, but it's it's fairly straightforward to come to and just say the relationship between y star and j star uh, is such that, that we could say that uh, j star times y star is equal to one. Let's call that equation 16. And if we want to also talk in magnitudes, we could say that then j star is equal to 1 over the magnitude of y star. Okay? Call that equation 17. So there's some additional relationships between the complex um, quantities that we, we would have in a, in a viscoelastic um, setting for use with oscillatory loading. Now I want to answer the question that we, we posed really when we started talking about the storage and loss moduli was that uh, because we showed that they depended, depended entirely on the relaxation modulus, that there must be a way to get the relaxation modulus from either the storage or the loss modulus. So there is. Let me show you how to do that. And I'll just say that uh, here we recall right, that the, the complex properties, so the complex Y star and J star uh, depended entirely right on on y of t the relaxation modulus and j of t the creep compliance respectively so the question that we want to ask is uh, can we get y of t and j of t uh, from y star and j star right that's the question that we want to answer okay what i want to make an observation is the following so observe that y prime, y double prime, j prime, and j double prime uh, are one-sided Fourier transforms. Okay? So what does that mean? That means I probably can take the inverse Fourier transform to, to get back the relaxation modulus and creep compliance. Okay? So I can take the inverse Fourier transform uh, to get back y of t and j of t, okay? So, so to do that, it's pretty straightforward. We say that y of t, we, we can get it from either of those, right? From either uh, the storage or the loss uh, quantities. So we could write that y of t is equal to the inverse Fourier transform, which is two over pi times the integral from zero to infinity of y prime of omega divided by omega times the sine of uh, omega t d omega. We could also get it from the loss modulus and say that y of t is equal to 2 over pi, the integral now from 0 to infinity. Now it's y double prime of omega divided by omega. And then this case is going to be the cosine of omega t d omega. Okay, let's call this equation 18 and equation 19. 
And I could do the same thing with the creep compliance. I can say that j of t is equal to 2 over pi times the integral from 0 to infinity of now j prime of omega divided by omega times the sine of omega t d omega. And I could also get it from the loss compliance. So j of t is equal to 2 over pi times the integral from 0 to infinity of j double prime of omega divided by omega times the cosine of omega t uh, d omega. Okay? So we'll call that equation 20 and equation 21. Okay? So again, th just a straightforward uh, inverse Fourier transform to get to these quantities. Um, but it just uh, closes the loop so that you can see how we can move back and forth um, from the, the time domain to the frequency domain. The last thing I wanted to cover was just to give you a qualitative uh, feel for, for how the storage and loss moduli behave. Okay, so let me give you a typical curve. Okay, so here is a typical uh, curve, or maybe curves, for the storage and loss modulus. Okay. So let me plot the modulus values on the y-axis and then on the x-axis will be omega. Remember, omega is a frequency. Um, so I'll say this is y prime and y double prime. Okay. So let's first think about, let's, before I draw this, what about the storage modulus? I mean, it's effectively acting kind of like the spring term, right? It's the non-dissipating component here. And, and so what do we think happens at high frequency versus low? Well, at high frequency, it sort of acts like rapid loading, right? So you're going to expect a stiffening response. And at low frequencies, it's going to be a very slow loading, so you'll expect a more compliant response. So, and that's exactly what you typically see. You'll end up with something that starts out small, ramps up to some other higher value, and then sort of asymptotes up there, okay? So this quantity here is going to be your storage modulus y prime, okay? Loss modulus can be thought of in the same way. If it's the dissipative term, you know that at very slow loadings, there's not a lot of dissipation. Very fast loadings, there's also not a lot of dissipation because um, the, the, let's say in the case of polymers, those chains can't respond rapidly enough. So somewhere in the middle, there's going to be a peak. And so you end up with a curve that rises up, peaks, and then dives off, okay? Something like that. So this would be your, your loss modulus y double prime, okay? So that's, that's roughly what you can expect um, in terms of uh, how these quantities behave. Of course, you could also plot the tan delta curve just by uh, dividing y double prime divided by y prime. So um, there should be a peak in the tan delta curve that it's approximately the same as the peak in the y double prime curve, although obviously, depending on how y prime behaves, it won't be exact necessarily. But anyway, uh, this is the kind of curves that you can expect. So if you're out there trying to calculate it and you come up, come up with a result that looks drastically different from this, something you should probably double check.